Good people of St. Richard's, welcome to Good Friday. A Friday where good triumphed over evil. Where light triumphed over darkness. Where hope trampled over fear. And where our perfect Lord sacrificed himself for our imperfect sins. You're most welcome today to come spend some time with us. To be able to reflect. To come see your face in the image of God. To remember that you are created in love and love has overcome all things so that you can be free. Free to live the life that you are created to be. Free to live a life of love, of hope and of joy. The service that we will be doing today is called the Tenebrae Service and it's a service about darkness. I'll explain as we go but through the service you'll be hearing poetry, there'll be some musical reflections, and there'll be some music towards the end as well. You'll hear different people reading different parts of, uh, of scripture to you. And each time when we hear some scripture, a candle will slowly be gently blown out. I'll just read an introduction to the service, and then we'll start from there. The word tenebrae comes from the Latin meaning of darkness or shadows. The tenebrae is an ancient Christian service that makes use of gradually diminishing light through the extinguishing of candles. We meditate on the shadows in our own lives and the hopelessness of a world without God. The service concludes with a loud noise, the sealing of a tomb, the ending has a feel of something unfinished because the story isn't over until Easter Day. So let's just start with a moment of quiet, the time where we can reflect on what God has done and for us on this day, but also to recognize the goodness and the love that he has given to us. So let's just start in quiet. The Collect for Good Friday. Lord Jesus Christ, who endured the horror of the deep darkness, teach us by the depth of your agony, the vileness of our sin, and so bind us to yourself in bonds of gratitude and love, that we may be united with you in, our, in your perfect sacrifice, our Saviour, our Lord, and our God. The prayer for St. Richard that's written on our St. Richard's window. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all the benefits that you have won for us, for all the pains and insults that you have borne for us. Most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. If you could join in with me in saying the Lord's Prayer. So as our Saviour taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. For yours is the glory, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Before we start, uh, I went to the church today and I'll post a beautiful picture of uh, a magnolia tree, I think it is, being coming into blossom at the church. It was beautiful to see. But I went to go collect these candle stands today for today. And as I went in, I heard a loud buzzing noise, a noise that I thought, crumbs, there must be something wrong with the electricity. So I walked down the church and eventually got into uh, the place where the St. Richard's window is. And there on the window was the biggest bumblebee I'd ever seen. This bull bumblebee was making such a noise and he was using so much energy to try and find a way out of the church, to find a way. And he was flying into all the windows, just trying to find some way to get out of this church. And he kept on flying straight into the window. And every time he flew with as much energy as he could, but each time it took more energy out of him. And as I tried to help him, 
he flew higher and higher up into the church, and I was thinking, wow, how can I be of service to this poor bumblebee? And I actually even prayed, Lord, could you send that bumblebee down so that I could be able to catch him and set him free? And at that exact time, the Lord said to me, Chris, this is my prayer for you. Chris, this is my prayer for us as a church, that we might no longer be trapped inside where we can necessarily see the goodness of the kingdom, but are finding blockades to our way. He wants us to be able to not only see what he has for us, but to be able to be free to be in it. And it's through the power of the cross that Jesus has made a way for us to have freedom. And just as he told me that, the bumblebee flew down and once more hit the St. Richard's window with as much force as his little wings could beat. And I grabbed the first thing I could, and it was a communion cup. And in the communion cup, I put this bumblebee, put a piece of paper over the top of him. And I thought he'd go berserk in the cup. But strangely, he was at peace. I took him to the door and gently opened the door. And I just felt this moment of peace and connection where the Lord was speaking to me just as much as I was looking after this bee. And I opened the door, took the piece of paper away and let that bumblebee fly. And in that moment, it was wonderful in the sunlight to see this beautiful creature fly off in complete freedom, living in the blessing that he was called to be. My friends, This is the power of Good Friday, that we are able to be free to be with the people that we were created to be, no more blocked by the sin or the sorrow or the shame that life has for us, able to see the world as we've always wanted to see it, and in the world that God has created us to be in. So let us enjoy the service, but also reflect where we are today, knowing that God loves us and has done all this because he wants to give us his joy his peace, and his love. There are seven candles here, and each represents a certain part of Jesus' uh, crucifixion and death. The first is the shadow of betrayal. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one, Lord? He replied, One of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, You have said it. The next is the shadow of the agony of spirit and arrest. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. 
Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed. My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray, so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping, because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd, armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. A poem called Gethsemane by Steve Garnus Holmes While we self-isolate, fear stupefied, he prays Not for himself, but for love of us Soldiers arm up and move out, but he prays Not for safety, but for love Death walks quietly, jingling its keys, but he kneels still, praying not for life, but for love, for you. Sit here while he prays, while he pours out his heart for you and your life and death and life again. Let his prayer wrap itself around you, Hold you to his heart, still praying for you, bearing you like a cross through the dark valley and beyond. We'll now have a piece of reflective music to be able to allow us to soak in the power of the words of people.
next shadow represented by the next candle is the shadow of denial. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another girl saw him, and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again, with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them, for your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a cock crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The next candle that is represents the shadow of accusation. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they're bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him! Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged, and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail the King of the Jews, they said. The next shadow we have is the shadow of crucifixion and humiliation. After they had mocked Jesus, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then 
they led him away to be crucified. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it up in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. I'm now going to read you a poem that I wrote this time last year for this day. A poem that I've entitled, A Good, Good Friday. You see, the goodness of this Friday, I'm not so sure. Undoubtedly wrenching, inexplicably painful, implausibly pure. Seemingly evil has overcome, sin has had its way. Darkness has cast its long shadow on this most harrowing day. A convicted murder freed, a blameless king enchained. Pilate might wash his hands of this, but for eternity we are all stained. Stained by the whips, the thorns, the torments of crucify him. In mankind's feral disposition, this created order has never looked so grim. Carrying that tree that he spoke into existence, still I, we and them shout with ever greater pers persistence that our guilt must not be rectified. Instead, we'd rather crucify innocence. This most holy of holy must die to maintain our filthy petulance. And yet he took humanity's filth encrusted cup of suffering and obediently sipped, and by our transgression was nailed to a cross, so on his creation God's blood dripped. So that his perfectness could justify mankind's sinful imperfection. 
that through his holiness God will not let evil have the last mention. For on that Friday, that good, good Friday, the God-man paid the ultimate price, the price you and I could never pay, but only Christ could by his sacrifice, that no longer darkness cast its long shadow, rendering, rendering a world diminished. For on that cross, Christ's actions and final word declared to evil that it is finished. So the goodness of this Friday, you can now be eternally sure. By his unfailing love, his perfect atonement, he has made all things pure. Our next candle is the shadow of death. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God.
candle is the shadow of burial. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb, and went away. <laughs>